In the 1980s, you had Iran and Iraq engaged in a, a fairly long term and brutal conflict throughout that decade. And this affected Western supplies of oil, which had to pass through the Persian Gulf and the Straits of Hormuz. And both Iran and Iraq attacked shipping, hoping to damage the economy of their adversary. And they used mines and anti-ship missiles as their choice of weapon. And in the case of Iraq, the regime had obtained Mirage jet aircraft and Exocet air launch missiles from the friendly French. By 1987, the conflict had prompted the UK and the United States to provide assistance in the Gulf to any neutral shipping outside of any belligerent exclusion zones. And although the US maintained neutrality, there was a reasonable rapport between the US and Iraq at the time, on the basis that the enemy of my enemy is, 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 is my friend. Um, so uh, we have a situation where, where ships such as the USS Stark was on patrol in the middle of the Gulf, May 1987. Stark was a, an Oliver Hazard Perry frigate, uh, and the Perry class were the low part of the US Navy's high-low ship strategy at the time. In other words, it was a, a very cheap frigate, but it still had defensive weapons such as standard missiles for, for engaging aircraft, a three-inch gun, which you can see in the middle of the ship on, on the superstructure there, and a phalanx close-in weapon system uh, just above the hangars on the stern there. All of those were capable of um, uh, taking out an, an inbound uh, aircraft or missile if necessary. And it also had multiple active and passive sensors around the the, um, the mast and the various uh, corners of the ship to give warning of attack. And it was also connected through its command information centre to theatre-wide intelligence assets. So you had um, airborne early warning aircraft feeding information to the Stark. You had other ships in the region using their radars. And they were all netted together to provide an overall, overall air picture. And the rules of engagement at this stage meant that US warships would challenge any approaching aircraft. And if they were fired upon, they would retaliate. And if you remember the 1987, two years after the film Top Gun came out and the famous phrase, you know, do not fire unless fired upon, that was the kind of rule of engagement that was, was in place in 1987. So it's a bit of a surprise when on May 17th, 1987, the start was struck by two Exocet missiles fired by an Iraqi Mirage aircraft. And there, there are lots of um, uh, things written about the, the incident. Um, by and large, it was command failure, which meant that the inbound threat was not detected until very late. The ship was not prepared for defending itself. Um, the Iraqi regime claimed that it was pilot error. They didn't intend to shoot at a... a US warship, and that's probably the case, but um, even so, um, uh, 37 crew on board the start were killed by the incident. And although the ship was unprepared for the missile attack, their very strong damage control efforts, um, once they were hit, managed to save the ship from sinking despite massive fires inside. Now, the first missile entered the port side just below and behind the bridge. And you can see the, uh, the line going from um, top to bottom here. If I'm very clever with them, um, this, I can use a laser pointer. Here we go. So the missile came in from the, the forward port, 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 um, port bow through the ship. The first missile stopped fairly quickly in the ship. Um, it didn't explode, um, but because it had been fired from relatively short range, it had a lot of unburnt fuel on it, which created a really horrendously hot fire. And it lodged in the berthing area, and that's where most of the casualties occurred. The second missile entered roughly the same spot, and you tend to find when multiple pits occur on a warship, they occur in the same spot because, for various reasons, particularly if it's a radar guided missile, it homes on the jagged edges of the, uh, the hole made by the first missile. Um, the second missile came in and um, entered the ship just inside the hull. It exploded, the warhead exploded. Um, luckily, because there was an existing hole from the first entry, a lot of the, the force of that explosion was vented outside um, rather than inside the, uh, the ship. But even so, there, there, there was a massive amount of uh, damage caused and a lot of fire started. The huge entry hole on the port side, you can see in the, uh, the top picture and the, the bottom left picture, um, massive damage there. It hit um, just below the bridge. 
on the superstructure and the second missile hit just um just uh, below the main deck um and if you look on the the two pictures on the right hand side this is showing the starboard side where some of the fragments of the missile went all the way through the ship and exited on the uh, the uh, starboard side so you've got pictures there of the uh, the, the sort of entry rooms and the exit rooms to the the warship there clearly the um the pictures were taken sometime after the fires were put out and when it was um, towed back into a port for repairs back to the the incident itself the ship itself was attended later in the night it was a, a, a early evening attack and um, the ship was uh, firefighting throughout the night it took on lots of water a lot of water was used for firefighting which itself can cause problems uh, making ship list further and also potentially causing it to sink so they had to punch extra holes in the ship to let the firefighting water out the crew also were evacuated by helicopter off the uh, the, the rear helicopter deck and uh, as I say, there were 37 fatalities and a number of uh, other casualties as well. The missiles, really, they weren't detected by any of the sophisticated sensors on board the ship. It was the Mark One eyeball of a lookout on the on the um, on the bow of the ship that actually saw the first missile coming towards the ship and raised the alarm, which was um, only a second or two away from the impact, so it did no good whatsoever. The start was actually quite a quite a seminal um, incident in um, in the Persian Gulf. It actually happened at the start of my career, um, being interested in, in supporting the Royal Navy. And so um, about 10 years ago, when I started up modelling, I thought I'd build a model Stark in its uh, damaged form. So I took the um, Academy 1350th uh, scale uh, injection moulded Oliver Hazard Perry class uh, model kit. It's a fairly cheap kit. Um, at that time, I was only spending you know £20 on a model kit rather than the what I spend these days, which is a little bit more. And for £20, you get quite a nice uh, 40 centimetre long representation of the, the Perry class. Clearly, uh, being a fairly cheap injection moulded kit, um, besides using Revel glue, I had to do something around the uh, the impact point. If, you, if I just buckled the uh, plastic out, it would have been far too thick for a reasonable representation of the uh, the plates of the real ship. So what I did was was cut out some of the uh, the plastic and inserted thin brass sheet as um, replacement plates, and then melded that into the rest of the uh, the uh, the hull to try and uh, make it look like a continuous um, continuous structure. That worked reasonably well, as you can see from some of the pictures uh, later on. I also, in order to uh, buckle and distort some of the, the plastic as if it was um, distorted from the fires. I just used a, a common or garden soldering iron brought judiciously close to the, uh, the plastic to cause it to buckle and warp a little. Um, another thing I find quite useful for creating battle damage, particularly shell holes, is um, to get a magnifying glass on a sunny day and hold it up to the plastic. You get superb uh, uh, effects from that. It is a bit smelly. Um, the kit itself came with some dreadful plastic railings, so I used um, photo etch railings and um, some other photo etch parts just to enhance the model a little bit. This was very early on my modelling career, so I didn't replace the masts and the radars with photo etch at that stage. If I did it again, I would probably do that. I concentrated on the main entry and exit holes. On the, on the top three photos there, you've got the, the pictures of the ship once it has been stabilised. Bottom three pictures are pictures of the model partway through construction. And if you look at the top left and the bottom middle pictures you can see i've managed to get a reasonable representation of the the buckled plates uh, at the entry hole positions but also comparing those two pictures you can see something i should have done which is i should have drilled out the windows of the bridge and also the bridge side doors on this port side because they were blown out by the blast and um clearly uh I, I, I omitted to do that in the plastic model. Um, hindsight's a wonderful thing. I used some uh, photo etch figures to represent the crew. Again, this was 10 years ago, and I used some Edouard um, 1350th flat photo etch figures and just painted those up. Um, they're, they're about sort of four millimetres high, each individual figure. Uh, these days, I think I would um, use something like 3D printed figures because you can get some lovely, fairly cheap 3D printed um figures of all sorts of things um, uh, through eBay or, or other sources. And you can get much, much better representations of people that way. And if we look here, this is the, the ship as it was nearing completion in my, my model studio. You can see the helicopter providing a bit of uh, evacuation on the stern there. 
there's some thread that I used uh, to represent the fire hoses going from aft to four because the main fire main in the ship was damaged during the, uh, the attack. So they had difficulty getting enough um, firefighting water to the forward end where the, uh, the fires were most intense. Um, and also, if you look on the left-hand picture, you can see the exit uh, damage on the, uh, the starboard side halfway, halfway along the ship there. And another view of the model just from slightly higher up, again, showing the, the damage. I did some um, a little bit of interior work, which hasn't come out very well in the photograph, but uh, I did some interior work to represent a few of the bulkheads within the, uh, the damaged area. So if, uh, if you shine a torch in there, you do get an idea of some of the internal structure. And in the real incident, one of the, the most serious aspects of it was that the fire, which was um, raging most fiercely just beneath the bridge, was very, very close to the forward missile launcher. And the forward missile launcher has a magazine with around 48 uh, missiles underneath it, which have um, warheads and also fuel on board. And, uh, a couple of very, very brave sailors spent 12 hours in that overheated compartment, fl uh, flowing water across the uh, the missiles to try and stop them from exploding from the, the fire damage, which is uh, quite incredible. Um, if they'd gone up, obviously the entire ship would have broken apart and sunk to the bottom. Another stern image here. If you look at the, um, just above the helicopter hangar, you can see the phalanx, um, also cannon there. It's a cannon with a white uh, radar on top of it. Uh, if it's in fully automatic mode, it would have intercepted the uh, the missiles coming towards the ship, but in practice, it was switched not into automatic mode. It wasn't even um, warmed up when the uh, the missile struck because the ship it was unprepared for um, the strike upon. And that's the the uh, model as it stands at the moment. Um, I've used it at uh, various events, illustrating battle damage. Um, so it was quite useful having a fairly sturdy plastic uh, kit as the, the base because it meant it could be handled and, uh, and looked at and poured over without too much damage um, being added by, by handlers as opposed to the damage uh, caused by the missiles. Follow up really from the Stark incident, um, there was further damage to US vessels in the Gulf a little bit later, a few months later, another Oliver has a Perry class frigate, the Samuel B. Roberts was uh, struck by a mine. And again, massive damage control efforts by the crew and superb uh, seamanship managed to save that ship. And if you get a chance, there's a book called um, No Higher Honour, Saving the Samuel B. Roberts by uh, Bradley Penniston. It's an excellent book to read about the, the, the whole incident. And also it impinges on um, some of the, the output of the Stark incident as well. Absolutely amazing uh, seamanship there. But that incident really did prompt some um, positive US strikes on Iranian assets um, subsequently. And the rules of engagement were changed uh, for US vessels in the Gulf so that they wouldn't have to absorb the first hit. But if they felt threatened, they could fire first. And that unfortunately led to the incident um, just about a year later than the Stark incident yeah. where the USS Vincennes, a Ticonderoga class cruiser, shot down a, an Iranian air uh, airliner with uh, a couple of hundred people on board because it misinterpreted that as a as a threatening aircraft and uh, took action to make sure that they themselves were not hit. And then three years later, we had the Gulf War of 1991, which totally reshaped the force structures in the region. But by that time, warships had developed better and faster responses to the threat of anti-ship missile attack. And also the crews uh, were better trained uh, both in the ability to detect attack and also to respond to it afterwards. And finally, a list of the uh, those who died um, on that dreadful day. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you.